The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this 12th webinar on the Secret Doctrine. Uh, as you all know by now, uh, this and all subsequent sessions will be available on Makara's squeaky clean new page, makara.us, under the subheading Moria Federation webinars. You see it circled there at the top, and you can see where the Secret Doctrine webinars are there, uh, along with many other um, headings. Okay. We begin each webinar by tracing HPD and Colonel Olcott's travels, as described in Olcott's old diary release. Last month, we found HPD and Olcott lecturing in and around a Colombo Ceylon, now called Sri Lanka, uh, where they were greeted by tens of thousands of enthusiastic Buddhist followers. The reason for their astonishing popularity was due to the fact that no outsider had ever championed, and especially articulately championed Buddhism before they came along. In fact, many missionaries had tried to force the islanders to adopt Christian beliefs. So as a result of that, they were just wildly popular. As we can hardly conceive of, uh, of their of the level of their popularity. Um, so we'll take a, a look at just one story before picking up where we left off in the Secret Doctrine. Our duo is still touring uh, Ceylon. Um, so if we could get a reader for one reader for this in the next page, we'll be fine. Anne, can you read that for us, please? Uh, yes. On the 26th, we drove to Matara, our southernmost point, and got there at 2 p.m. Four miles from the town, we were met by a procession, estimated to be a mile long, under the lead of a local headman. We took us in charge, the quintest and most striking features of an ancient Sinhalis Perehera procession were included in the function. And for us, it had all the attraction of picturesqueness. Picturesqueness. Yes, and novelty. There were, there were costumed sword dancers devil dancers, no, no chimis, with orchard faces. Ochred, ochred. Ochred faces. A revolving temple on a float, a van of mar marionettes. One sees them at nearly all fe festive gatherings in India, Ceylon and Burma, and numberless flags and swallow tails Swallow tail pennants were carried and waved by men and boys. Should I go on? Yeah, continue if you would. <laughs> Music played, Tom Tom speed, songs composed in our honor were sung, and as at Bentota, some ten miles of Ola, decorations framed to roads. One may imagine what sized audience such demonstrations caused together at the lecturing place where I spoke. It was in a palm grove by the seaside. I standing on a house veranda, the people sitting in the open. I had a trying interpreter that day and no mistake. First of all, he asked me to speak very slowly, as he did, as he did not understand English very well. Then he planted himself right before me, looking into my mouth as if he had read Homer, and watched to see what words should escape through the 
pens of my teeth. He stood in a crouching position and with his hands clasping his knees. I spoke extemporaneously without notes, commanding my gravity with difficulty, as I was forced to see the intense anxious, anxious, anxiety. anxiety depicted on his countenance. However, we managed it after a fashion, and the people were very patient and good-natured. Thank you, Anne. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. So far, we've covered three of the nine verses of the first stanza of Zion. Some pronounce it Zion. Um, I've heard it pronounced Zion. Maybe David Regal could could uh, clue us in on the correct pronunciation. Uh, before we move on to verse four, I'd like to read some comments sent in, or, or one of you to read, uh, some comments sent in by Anna Sklar, who I don't believe is here today, after the last webinar, from her many insightful observations, a few pages actually. I selected a few addressing the ahi, which were uh, introduced in verse three. Um, you can see it there, universal mind was not for there were no ahi to contain it. So, um, let's see, HPB tells us, uh, I want to give a little background on the ahi. Um, HPB uh, tells us that there are, that the ahi are the quote, vehicle for the manifestation of the divine or universal thought and will. They are the intelligent forces that give to us, that give to and enact in nature her laws, while themselves acting according to laws imposed on them in a similar manner by still higher powers. But they are not the personifications of the powers of nature as erroneously thought. This is just a, a little background. We discussed this last time. Um, it would seem that they are uh, are just another name for the Dian Chohans. Um, that's for me a bit confusing because uh, evidently there are still higher powers, and my understanding is there are no higher powers than the Dian Chohans. But there you have it. Um, anyway, so if we could get a reader to read these um, some of these thoughts that's sent to us by Anna Sklar. Carrie, can you read that for us? Okay. The Ahi are the bright. Oh, sorry, my, my line is my line is breaking up. I'll start again. <clears throat> the Ahi are the primordial seven rays or logoi, logoi, emanated from the first logos, triple, yet one in its essence. During Pralaya, there are no Ahi because they come into being only with the first radiation of the universal mind, which is undifferentiated, and the radiation from which is the first dawn of Manvantara. The Ahi are conditioned by the awakening into manifestation of the periodical universal law, which becomes successively active and inactive. When the hour strikes, the law comes into action and the ahi appear on the first rung of the ladder of manifestation. They belong to the first, second and third planes. The last plane, the last plane being really the starting point of the primordial manifestation, the objective reflection of the unmanifested. The ahi pass through all the planes, beginning to manifest on the third. Like all other hierarchies, on the highest plane they are arupa, that is formless, bodiless, without any substance. On the second plane they into form. On the third plane they become manasapu, 
Manasa Putras, those who become incarnated in man. On every successive plane, they are called by different names. There is a continual differentiation of their original. Yep, you broke up. This is from Anna Sela. Uh, you, the last two words are a homogeneous substance. Uh, you disappeared for that. Um, okay. We're getting an echo from you. Uh, Carrie, do you by chance have a, headphones? Uh, you're breaking up now. Anyway, if you do, it, that might help. Um, Anyway, you also, you also have two two devices. I think that might be one of the reasons there was an echo. I see yeah, your name yeah. twice. So okay. Anyway, thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Carrie, for that. Um, and thanks to anyone who has you know sends their thoughts via email. Uh, um, after any one of these webinars, you're all invited to do that, and uh, I will share at least some part of them with the group during the following webinar. Much of what Anna uh, states is confirmed by the online Theosophical Glossary, which also gives us this definition uh, of one of the aspects of, of the Ahi, uh, the Manasaputras. Uh, if we could get a reader to read this definition, that'd be great. Victor, can you read that for us, please? Manas Aprutras, from the hierarchy of compassion, the light side of nature has contrasted with the matter side. Came these semi-drive Mana, Manas Aprutras, who incarnated in the quasi-senseless, intelligently dormant human race, at about the midpoint of the third root race of this fourth round. By their own spiritual intellectual fire and flame, they quicken the latent mental fires in infant humanity, stimulating the thought principle. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Victor. Okay, let's move into verse four. The seven ways to bliss were not. The great causes of misery were not. For there was no one to produce and get ensnared by them. Okay, so let's start by taking care of the two short footnotes. The first footnote gives the name of the seven ways to bliss in Chinese, Burmese, and Indian, um, Nipang in China, Naiban in Burma, or Moksha in India. The um, second footnote defines the term Nidana, which describes the causes of misery. The footnote reads, quote, the 12 Nidanas in Tibetan Tenbrel, Chukmiri, the chief cause of existence, effects generated by a kind catenation of causes produced. So we'll be taking a closer look at the Nidanas uh, in a few moments. Okay, the first sentence of HPB's commentary on uh, verse four. Uh, I'm gonna, let's get a reader to read this. Terry, can you read Just, that for us, please? Yes, you can. There are seven paths, sorry, there are seven, oh, it is seven paths, yes, or ways in, in, in the, to the, to, to the bliss of non, not, non-existence, non um, when he is, which is, which is absolute, Absolute being, existence and con consciousness. They were they were not, uh, because the I universe, the one universe, the one universe was um, 
the, the one universe was so far empty and existed uh, only in the divine thought for it is and then it becomes very tiny and I can't read it oh no it's just up to there thank you yeah for it is dot 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 yes thank you uh, Terry um, okay um, the ellipsis at the end of the sentence introduces a, a device used throughout the secret doctrine um, suggesting a secret word or phrase that can't be given out to the general public. So it's not just that she just stopped speaking, but is for it is, and then she's referencing some secret word. So just in general, with this uh, first sentence, um, are there, does anybody have any thoughts or questions about this? The concept that, uh, the universe existed only in divine thought, helps to flesh out our understanding of pre-cosmic ideation as a kind of abstract storehouse of, of the noumenon of ideas, sort of like a, an uber permanent atom. Of course, this, is, this level is completely beyond any kind of conception, but there's in some way, uh, divine thought is held almost like in solution at this at this point so any thoughts about this first statement before we move on i don't see any yet okay let's move on to her second comment uh here we have a more in-depth description of the Nidanas, you remember the, from the footnote, the Nidanas are the causes of existence slash misery. So, you know, which are considered to be the same idea. Um, so could we get a reader for this section? Francis, can you read that for us, please? Yes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes. Okay. I'm starting with B. Yeah. The 12 Nidanas or causes of being, each is the effect of its antecedent cause, and a cause in its turn to its successor. The sum total of the Nidanas being based on the four truths, a doctrine especially characteristic of the Himalayan system. It's Hini. Long... Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm That's Hini. Yeah, Hini. Yeah, yeah. System. Go ahead. They belong to the theory of the stream of uh, Catan Cat Catanated. 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 Catanated, connected in a chain of series law, which produces merit and demerit, and finally brings karma into full sway. Okay, so. Any thoughts about this, this comment uh, connected with the Nidanas? Uh, interesting that, um, you know, each is a catenated, that is connected in a chain or series. That is to say, each is causal to the next. So there's this series of 12 uh, interconnected um, um, karmic and initiating causes for uh, uh, for existence and the misery that existence brings um, and these are called the nidanas stepping back a moment the most important thing to, to note so far is that this verse in fact the whole stanza is not actually describing pralaya or the absolute at all. Uh, it is rather describing what Palaya, the supposed subject of stanza one, is not. It's a bit like describing a mountain by saying it's not a flat, low-lying place. This is not because the true description of Palaya is a secret, but rather because 
language is just inherently incapable of describing this level of reality. Nevertheless, in this non-description, we are introduced to what immediately follows Pralaya to it, the Nidanas, or causes of existence, which we're told are successively causal, each being causal to the Nidana that follows, thus forming a 12-fold chain or cause and effect, which together form the essence of karma. Furthermore, this 12-fold concatenated series of laws are based on the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering. Suffering is caused by attachment to desires. Suffering can be ended by overcoming attachment to desires. And the way to end suffering is the Noble Eightfold Path. Then the Donas detail the depth of this karmic attachment that we are all involved in. So, because they're uh, so important to the system, let's take a closer look. The Nidanas are Francis. illustrated. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you have a couple of questions here from the yeah, previous. Good. So, uh, Diana asks, what is the primordial cause of the Nidanas? The prim well, the primordial cause in the dawn is, is um, pre-cosmic ideation. The very first, the, it's the initiation of the Manvantara itself. Um, and in that very act of manifestation, these um, effects are created they're in you could say that they're inherent to existence um, and I think you'll get a sense of that so they're not um, they don't uh, they're not a form of of punishment or law decreed by some deity uh, they are rather the the effects of existence so um, I hope that answers your question Anyone? And you said there was another. Right. And Veronica says, I feel it is talking about the 12 hierarchies on a higher level, a cosmic level. Hmm. Well, after we read the Nidana, see if, if that thought holds for you. Um, could we get, um, could we get a reader for the, somebody, someone who's comfortable, um, Reading uh, Sanskrit uh, would be would be great for this. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> There's a task for Scott? you, Scott. <laughs> Scott, how uh, comfortable uh, are you? <laughs> okay. Nidana, uh, Sanskrit, from knee down or into, plus the verbal root da to bind. That which binds to earth or to existence, philosophically speaking. Originally meaning bound, bond, rope, halter. From this arose the implication of binding cause or bonds of causation. And hence in Buddhist philosophy, it signifies, signifies cause of existence, the concatenation of cause and effect. The 12 Nidanas given as the chief causes are one, jata, birth. The four modes of entering incarnation, each mode placing the being in one of the six gatis, path or sphere of existence, entered upon by entities impelled because of past karma. Jara Marana, decrepitude, number two here, and death, following the maturity of the skandhas, manifested qualities and attributes forming the human being on all six planes of being. Three, Fafa, which leads every sentient being to be born in this or another mode of existence in the Trilokya and Gatis. 
four, Upanada, the creative cause of Bhapa, which thus becomes the cause of Jati. And this creative cause is the clinging to life. Five, Trishna, thirst for life, love, attachment. Six, Vidana, sensation, perception by the senses, the fifth skanda. Seven, Sparsa, the sense of touch, contact of any kind, whether mental or physical. Eight, Sharyantana, the organs of sensation, the inner or mental astral seats of the organs of sense. Nine, Nama Rupa, name form, personality, a form with a name to it. A symbol of the unreality of material phenomenal appearances. 10. Vijnana, the perfect knowledge of every perceptible thing and of all objects in their concatenations and unity. 11. Samskara, action on the plane of illusion. And 12. Avidya, knee science, ignorance. Lack of true perception. Okay, so obviously the purpose here is, you know, not that we master these 12, but I think we can all get a sense of the nature of these um, causes of existence and uh, by association causes of misery. Uh, they're actually illustrated here. You, you can see this is a, a detail of the circle and uh, they form the uh, outer rim of this um, of this circle uh, which is um, the circle or chains of samskara right, which is actually one of the nidanas so at this point it's uh, just important to realize that they exist and that they've been deeply studied uh, just what these uh, karmic bonds are uh, consist of right and and if nothing else you've now been introduced to the word concatenation right anyway uh, Vedana is illustrated uh, that's one of the uh, of, of these uh, 12 is illustrated in the Greek myth wherein Persephone um, here she is, uh, was doomed to existence in the underworld because she ate pomegranate seeds from that place, of course, being a metaphor for um, personality, physical incarnation. Um, so by employing her sense, in this case of taste, uh, she tied herself to this place. So it's it definitely... Uh, an example of, of one of the Nidanas. So, do we have any thoughts or questions on these 12 Nidanas? I hope uh, the person who asked about, you know, where did they come from uh, is uh, satisfied with the answer that they, in a sense, provide in and of themselves. Any thoughts or questions, further questions on these, on this group? Uh, yes, we have a couple of hands here, so let's go. Uh, Tanya, please go ahead. Okay, um, this is very interesting. I'd just like to contribute with a couple of comments. Sure. Um, this is the only, apparently from what I studied, the only visual um, drawing that Buddha gave to the disciples. All right, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a beautiful mandala. This this uh, a ferocious being is his name is Yama. It's is mm. the Lord of Death, and he controls this wheel. Okay, so it's a Kala Chakra, also mm. representation, and uh, the reading starts from the center. Uh, the, the 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 bindu of the mandala is the three root delusions, ignorance, attachment, and hatred, and then that leads to the the white portion in the left mm -hmm. to the which means the, the way to heaven, and then 
the, the other one on the right here uh, would be the, the you know falling down uh, into heliums. Mm -hmm. And then right the third wheel means sansara, the description of sansara, which are three superior levels and mm -hmm. three inferior levels or, mm -hmm. or uh, where you know where ignorance, uh, attachment, hatred uh, pervade. And then the nidanas, uh, after you understand each one of those wheels, you come to the nidana starting number one here, right? Um, it starts with the, um, let me see, with a right <laughs> tooth of Yama, which is uh, an old lady, blind, walking around, which means a person, you know, blind, mm -hmm. starting a new life. And these are also known as interdependent cause relationships. So mm -hmm. you move around, um, coming down, you know, uh, you know, from the top, down to, through your right, and all these stages are interrelated. Mm -hmm. Until you reach the ninth, when you start uh, programming your next life, and mm -hmm. so you imagine your new mother, and then um, you accompany the, the moment of your death, and you finally are conscious and decide where you want to be reborn. But uh, the, the interesting thing, just to conclude, is that um, Buddha is on top of the of the yantra. Um, uh, and he's pointing out to, to a white, um, which some people think it's a moon, but it's not. Apparently, you know, Buddha is saying that we can overcome this. We can destroy Yama with this knowledge. So it's an extremely mm -hmm. important uh, teaching in Buddhism. And mm -hmm. this white could mean the, um, the center of the galaxy. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, yes, I do recommend studying this uh, deeply. Tanya, thank you so much. That was really useful and helpful. I very much appreciate that. It gives us, you know, uh, a much uh, uh, better understanding of the entirety of, you know, the the fact that this is uh, yama or death that is uh, holding this mandala is, of course, most appropriate. So thank you. That's terrific. So, um, okay. Any other uh, thoughts or questions about this before we move on? Yes. Um, oops, Carrie, you're self-muted. Can you unmute yourself? Carrie's got his hand up and... Uh, Tanya answered my question. It was brilliant. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> that was my question. Yes. Oh, that's great. I'm glad she answered would, it instead of me. I would love... Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you. Um, I would love even more detail, but probably we haven't got time for that. Yeah, I think that that'll suffice for now. That's, uh, you know, this is... Um, available online for anybody who wants to take a closer look. You could blow it up and see these pictures, you know, uh, see the detail in this um, uh, um, more easily. Okay, so anyone else? Uh, Tanya, you have your hand up again. Did you want to say something else? No, no, no. I, I lowered my hand. I, I'm I'm just uh, pleased that I could contribute. Uh, there are books written about these teachings um, mm -hmm. because um, the main problem that we have is how to get rid of the lower realms and uh, and enter the higher upper realms, which we also study this in the astrology, esoteric astrology. So mm -hmm. this is a beautiful. It's one of my favorite teachings, the Twelve Nidanas. Mm -hmm. But uh, wow. you can find easily more information uh, on on the internet. You know there are Dharma nets uh, sites, and they're very mm -hmm. trustworthy for more details. Yeah, you know I can't help but think of the fact that uh, that uh, Dual Kool, the Master DK, you know, was a Tibetan who you know presided over a lamasery, and so was certainly familiar with this and. Um, all the core Buddhist teachings. Uh, and in the writings through Alice Bailey has translated this material into Western thought because we certainly have parallel uh, teachings, you know, in the 24 books of Alice Bailey to, uh, you know, the process of personality um, development, and then overcoming of that development of personality traits, right? Um, and esoteric psychology too is a, is especially um, focuses on on this what's represented here. So, 
Okay, then. Back to the SD. And, oh. Anything else? Yes. Go ahead. Tuya, please go ahead. You're self-muted. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you about that. I was just a little interesting detail about this name Yama, which is in very many traditions, and it is related mm. to very often to male. And if you think how it is written, it is written uh, Y A M A, mm. and then it is when you think about the syllables there comes the wife of Yama, who is Maya, uh, M-A-Y-A. -A. Yeah. And, and uh, yes, it's so interesting. And very often uh, in other tradition, Yama is uh, symbolized by serpent. By. So it's like, yeah, so like it's, it's um, uh, the whole idea where we have the serpent, in the mm -hmm. the tree of life and 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 the uh, the apple uh, the, uh, eva is taking mm -hmm. the apple and all of these mysteries is again into this whole uh, symbolism of uh, of this uh, entity samsara or in indicating the samsara but then the moon is related to maya so in those um, mm -hmm. the, like the lineage goes from maya to yama and Yama is the masculine, and Maya is the feminine. Just a little no. note. I don't no, know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Thank you. It's very useful. Thank you. Okay. And we. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Tanya, your hand is back up again. Did you have something more? Oh no, I lowered it. I'm sorry. I'm doing something. Wrong okay. Here. Well, when I call <laughs> on you, when I call on you, I lower it too. So I think oh, right. I think that was happening. Okay, oh. and then. Uh, Carrie, go ahead, please. You're self muted. Carrie, you're self muted. Did you? Your hand is up. Did you want to say something? There. It's a mistake. It's oh. a mistake. Sorry. Okay. I'll put it down. Um, uh, just a point of procedure here. These, uh, that hand raising thing is a toggle switch. So, uh, if BL clicks it and then you click it, you know, lowering your own hand, you will have then re-raised your hand. So, you know, just let BL lower your hand and don't, you know, don't click on it on it again unless you have something more to say. Just the point of procedure. Anyone else? Nope, that's it. Okay. All right, let's uh Get back to the secret doctrine. Um, and on to the next, on to her next comment on verse four. Can we get a reader for this section, this short comment? Tanya, can you read that for us, please? Uh, okay. Um, this uh let me see what we start reading it's based upon the great truth yeah okay it's based upon the great truth that reincarnation is to be dreaded as existence in this world only entails upon men's suffering misery and pain death itself being unable to deliver men from it since death is merely the door through which he passes to another life on earth after a little rest on its threshold, Devachan. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Tanya, do you have any comments about this? Uh, no, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> <with this. Absolutely. laughs> well, you, you know, you made some comments about this when you described the ninth picture, you know, where you. Yeah. Um, where you are kind of setting up your next life, you know, and you're yes, a yeah, whole, I, yeah, a whole new, yeah, a whole new set of desires to um, mm -hmm. you know, go through. You know, because, I think. It, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what I'm saying is, this is what's interesting. It gives us a hope that once we control the mind and master the mind through all the the process of the initiations, you know, then you you can have really full control about uh, what path to take. 
and yeah. uh, of course we studied this at Moria. Yeah, you know, we, you, the, the free will. Um, sometimes it seems like uh, uh, we don't have this free will because we're born. We have this bond to samsara. But once we understand the death is a threshold, is a passage. There's no real death, and that we can, uh, of course, um, prepare our path, our way where we want to go. Of course, bodhisattvas, they renounce nirvana. They choose mm -hmm. to return to earth to help um, human human beings and all the, all the sentient beings. So you do have this choice when you reach around level nine. Yeah. So you, you, you decide where, to, where you're going to be born and uh, what house, what family, and what school or whatsoever, and continue your path consciously. Right. That's, yeah, that's really you. nice. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. That's yeah. really terrific uh, uh, addition to this uh, understanding. So, you know, I would say that a kinder, gentler description might include mention of the growth gain during, you know, uh, each successive incarnation. You know, it's not just this hopeless circling of the wheel, though that happens literally thousands of times. But, uh, you know, DK's teaching is, um, uh, it just focuses on a different aspect of it, which is that we begin by building the personality and that this is as much a spiritual achievement uh, as is the later processes of initiation. You know, not to be directly compared, but successfully integrating the personality, uh, which most of humanity hasn't done yet, uh, is a great achievement. You know, and yet even at that level, you're still caught by these Madonnas. Um, but slowly and surely through the impress of the soul, um, a way out is gained. So uh, this uh, quote ends with um, uh, describing this uh, threshold, which uh, she calls Devachan. And uh, DK gives us a, a terrific uh, insight on um, on David Chan in Esoteric Healing. And if we could get a reader to, to read this. Trudy, can you read that for us, please? If, however, it is realized, can you hear me? Yes. If, however, it is realized that time is not known apart from physical plane experience, the entire concept of Devachan is clarified. From the moment of complete separation from the dense physical and etheric bodies, and as the eliminative process is undertaken, the man is aware of past and present. When elimination is complete and the hour of soul contact eventual eventuates and the, and the monastic vehicle is in progress of destruction, he becomes immediately aware of the future. For prediction is an asset of the soul consciousness, and in this the man temporarily shares. Therefore, past, present and future are seen as one. The recognition of the eternal now is gradually developed from incarnation to incarnation and during the co continuous process of rebirth. This constitu constitutes a state of consciousness characteristic of the normal state of the advanced man in brackets, which can be called Devachanic. Devachanic, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, we have it, you can see the, the, the difference in perspective here. You know, where he says uh, um, the recognition of the eternal now is gradually developed from incarnation to incarnation and during the continuous process of rebirth, you know. Uh, inserting purpose into the process. So um, this eternal now must certainly be related to uh, Kala, 
remember this concept of undivided time that we looked at um, a couple of webinars ago? Um, the totality of time un, un, taken out of the, the idea of, of um, moving from point A to B in time. So uh, any thoughts or questions about this, um, this quote from uh, DK, this esoteric healing quote? I find the last statement particularly interesting. A devachanic state of consciousness is the normal state of consciousness of the advanced man. That's quite interesting. Um, okay, let's get back to the SD here. Uh, can we have a reader for this next comment? Uh, Antoinette, can you read that for us, please? Please. The Hinayana system or school of the little vehicle is of very ancient growth, while the Mahayana is of a later period, having originated after the death of Buddha. Yet the tenants of the latter are as old as the hills that have contained such schools from time immemorial. And the Hinayana and the Mahayana schools, the latter that of the great vehicle, both teach the same doctrine in reality. Yana, or vehicle in Sanskrit, Vahan, is a mystic expression. Both vehicles inculcating that ma man may escape the sufferings of rebirth and even the false bliss of devachan by obtaining wisdom and knowledge which alone can dispel the fruits of illusion and ignorance. Thank you, Antoinette. Appreciate that. So any thoughts or questions about this uh, passage? There's no need to get into a comparison of the two schools of Bo Buddhism. It's not really our purpose. As the HPB's last point, uh, you know, where she's, she talks about obtaining wisdom and knowledge is the way out. You know, I wonder, if uh, obtaining wisdom knowledge is effective primarily because it leads to the process that DK calls identification. Certainly becoming versed in spiritual teachings, even when stimulating the intuition, is not going to be enough to defeat the Madonnas that hold us on the wheels of incarnation. Um, at any rate, we know that our teachings in uh, from our teachings in DK that it is a very gradual process punctuated by initiations that lead us out of personality control. So any thoughts on this uh, before we move on? Tanya, do you have any uh, incisive insights on the Hinayana and Mahayana uh, schools? I, I would say that, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the Hinayana system is the little vehicle because uh, that means we, when we are concentrated on the ego, low ego, the personality. So there is a shift there, an important shift when you be, when you go from Hinayana to Mahayana, and then you you develop Bodhicitta, which is the altruistic mind, and you start getting involved uh, into the collective. But I think it's interesting about this paragraph is that um, um, HPB is mentioning that um, about the, the sufferings of rebirth, you know, the cycles constantly coming and going, and even the false bliss of Devachan. In other words, a lot of um, devotees or disciples, when they reach Nirvana, they think that's the end of the, end of the, of the path, the mm -hmm. end of the way, but it's not. It's uh, enlightenment. And in order to reach enlightenment, you do need this wisdom and knowledge because they are the only ones that will um, b b bring you this freedom from illusion and ignorance. Mm -hmm. While in Nirvana, you, you, you know, you become um, a Pracheka Buddha. You just enjoy and you don't um, get concerned with teaching or passing on the Dharma. I see. So, <laughs> so even release is its own uh, intermediate stage that has to yes. be transcended. Yes. So, uh -huh. 
It's, it's a calling, you know, not to be be careful with the false bliss of Devachan. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, is uh, anybody want to speak of personal experience of being stuck in the false bliss of Devachan? Well, Francis <laughs> has his to, hand I'd up, but I'm that. not sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, I think um, one of the important factors here is to realize that uh, Devachan, as the uh, Tibetan presents it, is still on the lower 18 subplanes. And therefore, in a sense, um, below the type of consciousness that can be achieved in the causal body. So it's somehow still in the dense, formal, physical body of the planetary logos. You know, bringing a little cosmic fire into this, that um, we do not have release from form in Devachan. And it, for that reason, because it belongs to the realm of the moon in a way, you know, mm. it's the high, highest of the 18 subplanes where the final Devachan uh, is found. But not, not Nirvana. You know, we call the atmic plane the Nirvanic plane, and there seem to be a number of Nirvanas uh, which are much higher than anything that we can think of uh, in terms of Devachan. So mm -hmm. even the monadic level is a kind of uh, nirvana that the Buddha achieved and beyond and beyond. So we're still stuck, you know, when we're mm -hmm. in this Devachanic uh, world. And, and interestingly, not everybody is sort of um, allowed to go there. Uh, at least what he's saying in Cosmic Fire, because you have to work up a certain amount of uh, mental longing to be fulfilled in that mental world. And in the early days of incarnation, we, we just don't have that substance that takes us there. And later, we kind of hang out there uh, if we wish, but uh, those who are really committed to service return rapidly and uh, do not uh, they forego their devachan if they're allowed to and mm -hmm. that means you know they have to kind of open open up that uh, sixth petal of the egoic lotus and then they're allowed to forego their devachan which uh, you know is plunging right back into the usual suffering of form but okay by that time their sense of values is so highly developed that they realize the kind of illusory bliss that David Chan is. Mm. Oh, that's very useful. Yeah, there's a shift in gravity uh, in the center, the point of the center of one's being, where they're they're oriented towards selfless service enough mm. that mm. Uh, if that allows them to break out of of that uh, well personal bliss and the, and the rest <laughs> and the natural rest that that brings because i'm sure it's it's part of the natural order you know to need that yeah, rest, yeah you know yeah. And, uh, and 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 the working up of faculty that's what's interesting too the working up of faculty in devachan which can be used in the next incarnation so uh, you know it's 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 not it, it, it's not just uh bliss there is some usefulness in it in terms yeah. of pro propelling your incarnations forward mm. yeah. it's so fascinating yeah, yeah. see you there thank you okay, yeah yeah sure yeah <laughs> okay so you know it's, it's if it belongs to the lower 18 planes it seems like the highest of those it, it seems mental it would like it would have to be as you say you since you have to have developed some quality of mental longing slash awareness to propel you into it that uh, I wonder if it has its loci on the fourth subplane of the mental which would be the highest of those 18 um, yeah that, 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 that's what, that is where it is according to I mean there are, there, are, there are other heavens you know but yeah. this is where the David Chan is found okay. on the fourth subplane right on the border you know between right there uh, yeah reality and uh, Illusion. Yeah. Right there. Of a kind. Of a kind. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Okay. So thank you.
All Here right. Francis, um, Francis yeah. has a question. Just a quick comment, and I was resonating with what Tanya said, and then <clears throat> the words that stood out with me was Francis just reiterated that Michael was speaking of was mental longing. That really resonated with me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's the highest, it's a very high level of lower mind, <laughs> this mental longing. Uh, uh, but it's still subject to object. You know, you are, it's, it's one of the last traps of duality where you're longing for the other on uh, mental levels. Whereas uh, the quality of intuition brings in the sense of unity. Uh, which I think ultimately propels you up on into the third subplane and uh, replaces longing with uh, uh, alignment with with uh, soul yeah, mm. through the intuition. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, so basically we have to somehow live a life uh, which is as selfless as possible. And I would say that uh, we begin, we really begin to do that in the sixth pedal kind of thing, where there is a lot of selflessness in a personal sense beginning to demonstrate. And when that finally opens up, and I believe it's at the second initiation or so, mm -hmm. you can forego the bliss of Devachan if so you choose. I see. So would that be the sacrifice pedal of the middle tier? To to me, uh, to me, um, the the final the sacrifice pedal of the middle tier completely open will signify that ability to forego uh, inwardly the usual compulsion to work up faculty in Devachan for the fairly advanced person. I so see. you know well, we have our work cut out. <laughs> That's for sure. It makes sense yeah. that it would be a sacrifice pedal because, you know, from a personality point of view, which is always the view of sacrifice, it mm -hmm. would, you know, it would seem like a sacrifice to turn one's back, you know, on Devachan uh, and, you know, re-enter the fray, so to exactly. speak. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And there's some opening of pedal number seven and eight as well, not completely. But that will allow the full opening of six. And and the funny thing about that one is that then a higher initiate can use your body to put in an appearance at that point. So at the, it's, it's a, a, at the when when the sixth is completely open and the second yeah. initiation has been taken. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So okay. anyway. Yeah. The, it's, the, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, there's you know we tend to think of this as is having to do with the second principle and the soul and the love wisdom aspect. But the second initiation uh, is, is characterized by will, alignment with, with the will in mm -hmm. order mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. ready oneself for monadic contact. It's, it's, it's funny how it, it's, that aspect is always like one step in front of what's actually accomplished. Um, yes. Yes. You know, uh, indeed, indeed. Because we normally think of the second initiation as the overcoming of desire, you know, in the in the astral level, and therefore having to do with the second ray and the um, alignment with the second principle. But it's yeah. it's what I've read about it anyway. It it suggests that the will is uh, the dominant uh, activity that's brought into bear brought to bear. Uh, yeah, I would say that the first three aspects of divinity each get a workout at the second degree because you know there's that uh, spiritual intelligence and mental illumination so that's sort of the third aspect mm -hmm. and then there's the calming calming down with love of the astral body and then like you say there's the preparation to begin approaching shambhala and the monad the will aspect so it's a, it's significant in all three uh, areas yeah. and, and it's a high it's a high thing too so in case we just think somehow we've passed through that, well, you know, we, we better think again. It's yeah. very demanding. It's demanding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Francis, oh, yeah. Tuya has had her hand up for a little bit. There you go. Yes, go ahead, Tuya. 
just little continuation about the words that the, when we think about Deva Chan, the Deva um, can be translated the shining ones and Shan uh, itself also shining or in, in um, Chinese it is translated meditation mm. and uh, the purpose is to meditate uh, uh, and, and um, in aiming to become as a Buddha or the shining one. Mm. So I think that it is revealing the purpose of this uh, devachanic state that uh, that is meant for meditating deeply as becoming this mm. high shining one. Mm. Oh, that's very insightful. Thanks. It's, it's always great to get into the etymology of these words because they really reveal a, a level of meaning that's uh, otherwise not apparent. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, I, I don't guess I can call the two of you Yama and Maya. That, that would be maybe a little much, but uh, uh, you are a dynamic, a dynamic duo in your own right, you know. Am yeah, I, 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 I'm not thinking about it just the other way. <laughs> Funny thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Speaking that of that, nice. thank you. <laughs> let's see if we can segue. Do we have another comment before we move on? No, that's all I see right now. Okay. Segueing right into Maya, uh, would someone like to read this? Uh, this next comment. Let's have Maya read it for us, too. Oh, I think so. <laughs> so which one? Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yep, she's still Tuya. saying self-muted. Can you read that for us, Tuya, please? Come back. Yep, she Thank left you. us. Michael, can you read it? Yeah, well... As long, as long as I've been designated as Maya, uh, I uh, might as well. Uh, well. She and I will talk about that later. Okay, so Maya, or illusion, is an element which enters into all finite things. For everything that exists has only a relative, not an absolute reality. Uh, since the appearance which the hidden noumenon assumes for any observer depends upon his power of cognition. To the untrained eye of the savage, a painting is at first an unmeaning confusion of streaks and daubs of color, whilst uh, an educated eye sees instantly a face or a landscape. Sometimes I've called uh, the universe Mahamaya, and uh, you know the great illusion. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, maybe DK means something else by that. Uh, he does tell us that illusion, as we know it, does not cease until our ninth initiation, when we are finally yes. free. <laughs> yeah, free of the cosmic physical plane. So these are very relative words, and if, I'll just say one thing: that whenever you have a limited perceiver who cannot perceive the whole you necessarily have relativity and maya mm. i've been Indeed. kind of working yeah go ahead yep. no i was just going to say it. oh yeah. yeah the key phrase here is the appearance which the hidden noumenon assumes for yeah. any observer depends on upon his power of cognition this is this is a hole that we could all fall down you know the, because it's right. uh, often her comments lead into really deep areas and here's one of those comments right uh exactly. the exactly. appearance which the hidden noumenon assumes so right there just that phrase the hidden mm. noumenon is our essential selves which you know we tend to think of as uh as monadic but it goes right mm. all the way up to you know the Diani chohans because the monads yeah. themselves belong to great groups of beings right uh, right so in that all is this hidden noumenon and it assumes an appropriate appearance uh you know for the level of the 
uh, consciousness of the jiva, you know, who will be inhabiting that appearance, right? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Mm. And then, but then the second phrase is interesting too, the appearance which the kid Numenon assumes for any observer depends upon his power of cognition. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you know, we've been studying a little bit about illusion, you know, in the glamour group, and he says, well, be careful what you bring to the interpretation of an idea, because it may be completely inadequate in the real grasping of the nature of that idea. In other words, your interpretive equipment just isn't sufficient to get it. So yeah. I think there's something about that in, in the sevens. Oh yeah, it's you know the okay. truth of a master is is quite different than the than the truth of someone interpreting this idea of you know on the physical plane. Um, exactly, and exactly. it's going to be at a whole other level. Yeah. So you know the idea that Maya is not only fostered by the inherently illusory quality of the vehicle itself, where Maya is just inherent, but it is also a relative phenomena conditioned by the quote, power of cognition of the observer. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So H.P. Mm -hmm. gives the example of a painting as seen by the untrained eye compared to that of an educated person. We might mm -hmm. also imagine what a master sees when he looks at a human being, his or her physical, astral, and mental etheric energy systems, for instance, and mm -hmm. which would certainly be uh, more causal than what we notice you know, mm. by means of, you know, facial expressions, tone of voice. It's, exactly. Uh, this, is, this is a gestalt psychology. In other mm. words, the, the ability to see wholeness rather than just partiality within some aggregation of forms. Uh, the farther we go along the way, the greater our gestalt ability, the greater our ability to see, perceive wholeness. And so ours is quite limited compared to the master. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Right. So anyone else uh, have any thoughts about this, this section? There's some real, <laughs> so interesting. She often will embed a ju philosophical jewel that shines as brightly as any you'll find anywhere. Um, and then go on, you know, blithely with a, you know, a, a more prosaic uh, um, example of that, you know. Uh, but when she, she, I think all of us can quickly understand the idea of, of you know, an uneducated person seeing a painting compared to, you know, an educated person. But it runs much deeper than that, this core idea. Any uh, thoughts? Anybody? Yes, uh, Tuia, go ahead, please. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about one sentence, which is interesting what TK says, that the time is only an aspect of Maya. Mm. And we can contemplate about that. Yeah, it is in and of itself an inherently Mayavic. Uh, the, Time seen as a sequence is inherently my own. Yes, indeed. Anyone else? Yeah? Uh, Tanya? Yes, uh, yes, I have, I just, I'm just here remembering the teachings of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau about mm -hmm. the noble savage. You know, um, mm -hmm. how would you uh, explain this? In other words, what Rousseau defends, and, uh, and of course in Buddhism this is also discussed is the importance of direct uh, experiences. In other words, uh, wisdom can be achieved by direct experiences and not necessarily only upon uh, knowledge. So I would like to hear your comments, Francis, about this. Well, I think, yeah, I think wisdom is a step further. You know, you, it's, uh, you know, it's the second half of love wisdom for a reason which is that you really have moved beyond the third principle or the third aspect uh, 
which is separated mind where knowledge can be gained. This is also the place of the halls of knowledge, you know, which are also the halls of ignorance slash knowledge. But that leads into, uh, through experience uh, and contemplation, uh, wisdom and can be then gained. Uh, and I think it's always a, a second principle quality um, that comes th through the impress of the soul. That's my take on it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's see, what was I going to say about this? Um, I had a thought. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Any other comments about this comment, uh, this commentary? Anyone? Nope, that's all I see. Okay, then uh, let's move on to your next comment. Okay, um, Tuya, can you read that for us then, please? Yes, no. I didn't find back that the microphone button um, the, the, for a while ago, but now I have it. So um, let me see, I put a little bit bigger. Okay. Nothing is permanent except the one hidden absolute existence, which contains in itself the noumena of all realities. The existences belonging to every plane of being up to the highest Diane Chohans are in decree of the nature of shadows cast by a magic lantern on a, on a colorless screen. But all things are relatively real, for the cogniser is also a reflection, and the things cognized are therefore as real to him as himself. Whatever reality things possess, must be looked for in them before or after they have passed, like a flash through the material world. But we cannot cognize any such existence directly, so long as have sense instruments, which brings only material existence into the field of our consciousness. Thank you, Yama. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thoughts or questions about this? This is a continuation, uh, and it actually explains um, some of the points that we looked at in the previous section. Um, so, anyone have any thoughts or questions? This, the hidden absolute existence which contains in itself the noumena of all realities. That gets right back to, you know, in the previous, uh, where it says, um, uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, the hidden noumenon, the, the appearance which the hidden noumenon assumes. She keeps referencing this uh, deepest level of self, right? Um, it's, and it's one of the main tenets of theosophy, you know? Uh, and ultimately, it's another reference to the absolute. Um, because that's when you're moving up to absolute self, that's, that's where you, you must end up. Uh, HPB makes an important point that, quote, all things are relatively real, for the cognizer is also a reflection. Now, a cognizer just means, you know, that one who is doing the understanding, is doing the cognizing. Uh, and the things cognized are therefore as real to him as himself. <laughs> okay, so the level of reality of the, of the thinker, I'll say instead of cognizer, uh, the level of reality of the cognizer, of the thinker, and those, the things that are being cognized or being thought about are at the same level because they they um, they share the same level of reality if you're if you're 
going from below upwards and unreality as you going from, you know, above downwards. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, interesting thought. DK references this relative reality when he states that the truth of a master, I mentioned this before, is not the same as the truth of a disciple because obviously the greater scope of the master's awareness has a lot to do with perspective. Let's see, another important point that HP Bay makes is the binding or blinding effect of what she calls the sense instruments whose use just by being uh by using our senses uh we are polarized in the outer world and thus our um, our true identity is hidden from us by the fact of the use of the senses this relates to uh the sixth nidana um, which is called Vedana, perception by the senses. Uh, so do we have any thoughts or questions about this segment? Yes. Um, oops, there you go. Uh, okay, can you talk now, Francis? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, just a comment or question. Mm -hmm. uh, speak to the absolute existence which contains in itself the domain of all realities. And then later says, can only look for in them before or after they have passed like a flash to the material world. The question is, is that a relative statement? That, or, uh, uh, and how much you comment on that? Yeah, it is a relative statement. Um, Let's say to go back, but we cannot cognize any such existence directly, meaning by the senses. So long, as, no, that's not what it means. Sorry, we cannot cognize any such existence directly. So long as we have sense instruments, which brings which bring only material existence into the field of our consciousness. Oh, I mean, let me go back a little further. Whatever reality things possess must be looked for in them before or after they have passed like a flash through the material world. So the fact of their appearance in the material world in and of itself makes their reality unrecognizable because um, what is seen is the illusion um, of the the temporary vehicle that is uh, taken before or after that um, if one were to uh, have an experience of, of their existence uh, you would be freed from um, assessing them by means of the senses and so you would be able to uh, have a, a, a uh, a more direct understanding of, of their true self, so to speak. Um, that was said rather clumsily, but I hope you understand it. It, it. it reminds me of an earlier example she gives where she talks about this bar of metal that drops from the clouds, suddenly appears, and then is drops on into the ocean. And she was saying that uh, that bar of metal is cannot be judged at all by its sudden appearance just above the waves before it plunges you know into uh the into the past because what she was talking about then is is uh the future moving into the briefest of moments of the present before it, it moves on into the past and the thing same, same idea holds here which is that the continuous reality of of a, um, a jiva or uh, of a being is can only be determined by awareness outside of that time continuum because only then can you get the full scope of the reality of their being a um, little clumsy but that's that's what I've got um, on that question. 
Any other thoughts? Or questions? I don't see anything. Okay. Uh, let's see, another important policy. Oh, yeah. So this looks like that. Okay, just moving through the material here. Okay, so HPB's final comment on verse four. Um, can we get a reader for this, please? And Veronica, can you read that for us, please? Yes, can you hear me? Sure can. Hello. Hi, yes, go ahead. Whatever plane our consciousness may be acting in, both we and the things belonging to that plane, all through the time being, are only realities. As we rise in the scale of development, we perceive that during the stages through which we have passed, we mistook shadows for realities, and the upward progress of the ego is a series of progressive awakenings, each advance bringing with it the idea that, that now, at last, we have reached reality. But only when we shall have reached the absolute consciousness and blended our own with it, shall we be free from the delusions produced by Maya. So, thoughts or questions about this one? The statement reminds me of DK's teaching on the point of tension, which we're told is the means of bridging to the next level of awareness. You know, I think we've all had the experience of even looking back on our own lifetime of, of seeing the way that we thought and what we held to be important earlier on in our early in our lifetimes is, is so irrelevant to our, um, our current understanding. You know, it gives us just a, a, a mini picture of the much greater sweep of moving from lifetime to lifetime, you know, through successive levels of consciousness. Anyway, um, can we get a reader for this uh, uh, teaching on the point of tension? Uh, Catherine, can you read that for us? Well, I'm not able to un. Mute is she muted? Thing. Well, I keep trying to unmute her, but it tells me she's still muted by an organizer. So let's try. Um, Brennan, can you read that for us, please? You're self muted. Hello? Yes. Hi, Brennan. Hi, I'm still here. Great. There are certain changes which disciples must themselves initiate. These may not touch environing outer conditions, but concern inner developments, attitudes, and mental processes. These self-initiated decisions can and do lead to basic inner unsettlements, and these inner disturbances are necessary to and preparatory to great, uh, in great inner crises. These inner crises lead to points of tension, as well you know, and from a point of tension, the merging and soul personality can then move onward into greater light and a more surely realized love. Words are really small. <laughs> oh, really? I'm sorry. Yeah, that. I'm on my cell phone. <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't know how you could do that. That's amazing. Um, thank you, Brennan. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, so, any any thoughts or questions about this? You can see the connection, I hope, to uh, HPB's thoughts on this matter. Um, here, where we get a description of of how we move forward, right? Now, surprisingly, through great inner crises, right? Which Ray does that remind you of? Yeah, the fourth ray of that characterizes humanity itself. Um, 
So any any ideas about this? Let's get back to, um, oh, that goes on. Any thoughts, any more thoughts about this last um, comment connected with uh, the fourth verse? Please go ahead, Francis. I would just add to DK's statement there. Just, yeah, sure. Here we yeah, are. Just contemplating. And in the end, as you said, into greater light and a more surely realized love. And I read that. Five that is came to be the wisdom, love, love being the greater. Love is the journey, and the goal. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it certainly is uh, one of the uh, primary methods for uh, moving beyond personality control. Yeah. Thank you, Francis. Anyone else? Before we move on. So you get the sweep of this. Um, you know, I can't make it all large and white at the same time, but uh, one of the reasons I'm using this system is of um, highlighting the section we're on is so that you can get a sense of what the comment we're focusing on belongs to. And um, all of these are of, you know, have a continuum. All these comments uh, 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 are of a theme or thematic in their uh, presentation. So I'd like to just end with the uh, rereading number four, the seven ways to bliss were not great causes of misery were not. For there was no one to produce and get ensnared by them. So that somewhat pitches it back up to this uh, level of absoluteness, which uh, stanza one is all about. Okay, then let's move on to verse number five. Who would like to read this verse? Lona, can you read that for us, please? Yes, um, from darkness. Yes. Despite darkness alone filled the boundless all, for father, mother, and son were once more one, and the son had not awakened yet from the new wheel in his pilgrimage thereon. Thank you, Lord. Uh, before we step into the commentary, anybody have any any thoughts about this just in its pure form? Any thoughts? Okay, let's move on to the first sentence of the commentary. Can we get a reader? You can just start with uh, the commentary itself. Jeremy, can you read that for us, please? So, I don't hear him, so let's see, K Carrie, can you read that for us? You're self-muted. There we go. Just click your microphone icon. He did, he's green. I don't hear him yet, but he's green. Carrie? No. Okay, someone else. Okay. Um, Scott, can you read that, please? Darkness is father, mother. Light is their son, says an old Eastern proverb. Light is inconceivable, except as coming from some source, which is the cause of it. And as an in instance of primordial light, that source is unknown though as strongly demanded by reason and logic. Therefore, it is called darkness by us from an intellectual point of view. As to borrowed or secondary light, whatever its source, 
it can be but a temporary myopic character of a temporary myopic character. Thanks, Pat. So, uh, thoughts and questions? Some find the mandorla, also known as the vesica pieces, uh, a useful illustration of this concept. Unified father, mother, son is represented by the encompassing circle. Uh, when they separate during manifestation uh, or in preparation for manifestation, they become the two overlapping circles, spirit and matter, uh, father, mother, which creates the sun, represented by the third shape, the mandorla at the center. This is the realm of primordial light and indeed of all manifestation. One of the most esoteric ideas in theosophy is that primordial light is philosophically seen as darkness. This is why certain Eastern deities, as well as the Black Madonna in the West, are depicted with dark countenances, suggesting that their origin is at a level more primordial than where Mayavic light is known. This could be emanating from the realm of the father aspect, as illustrated on the left, uh, or from the mother aspect, as shown on the right. Rule nine in Race and Initiations describes this higher reality. Um, it's it's got to be right up there among my very favorites of the old commentary. It's a truly moving, profound rule. Uh, Michael, can I get you to read this? Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, rule nine for disciples and initiates. Let the group know there are no other selves. Let the group know there is no color, only light. And then let darkness take the place of light, hiding all difference, blotting out all form. Then, at the place of tension, and at that darkest point, let the group see a point of clear, cold fire, and in the fire, right at its very heart, let the one initiator appear, whose star shone forth when first the door was passed. There, there's two, it's wonderful. They, they, they actually have it in two forms. The more poetic form is when first the door was passed. And you find that in one of the presentations. And then someone decided, well, wait, that's not the right word order. So then they said, when the door first was passed. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, when, wonderful. What's the first one again that is other than this one? When uh, Who starts from forth when first the door was uh, passed. Instead of when the door was first uh, passed or first was passed, you see. Yeah, and they yeah, dropped the poetry. Yeah, yeah they dropped it. Better. Huh. Is one in IHS and the other in uh, RI? Yeah, it might be. I can find it. You know, I can go looking at it. Yeah, I wonder which came first. <laughs> the more poetic yeah. one? It's a good. It's a good question. I can. Yeah. I can go take a quick look. Uh, oh, okay. You know, and let you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are feeling especially brave and intrepid, um, could you comment or, you know, uh, put a question forth on this uh, amazing rule number nine? I include it because he literally describes the process of moving beyond light, which is what our theme has been, right? That primordial light is actually dark to the senses, right? It's darkness, it's in, in our understanding, except for the initiate, the high initiate who sees that light, mm -hmm. that primordial light, right? And so here he's saying, you know, beyond, passing beyond color to light, and then beyond light to darkness, right? 
which hides all difference, blotting out our form, which, of course, you're moving beyond the third aspect altogether here, that the, the form world is completely left behind here. Um, I would suggest you, this is right on the verge of, of the process of identification, right? Um, and then here's, here's the reason I introduced this, was the place of tension or one reason I introduced it. Um, at the place of tension and at the darkest point, um, this new reality is perceived. So any thoughts or questions about this uh, amazing rule or about the, um, uh, the uh, segment mm -hmm. that we just, that we just uh, were looking at? One page 172, uh, Francis, of raise and initiations. By the time you get there, uh, it's first the door was passed. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's, anyway, you know. The door, rather than the door first was passed first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, it keeps the it keeps the rhythm, the meter, you know, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, you know. Yeah. So the first use of it was on page 22 of Raising Initiations, and he had it the other way around. No, I, yeah. I like it. I definitely like when first the door was passed. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, any any thoughts? We also come back to... Well, uh, come yeah, back we have... Uh, we Franc go. Francis, go ahead, please. Uh, just my thought. <clears throat> Father, Mother, uh, I'm replying that the Mayavak light is a direct result, reflection of duality, of the mother-father aspect? Eventually, yeah. Um, the yes. first result, however, is primordial light. And all of creation, all of manifestation is um, in this. Here, let me bring up the, the mandorla so you can see it. Where am I? Ah, go back. Here we are. So in that central section with this label, the sun, you could say from one perspective, there's many ways of looking at this, but um, because after all, it is a metaphor. But from one perspective, sonship actually includes all of manifestation because everything is conscious to some degree or another. So there is no pure spirit aspect um, until till Pralaya, to the return to Pralaya, called in Theosophy, the day be with us, right? And there is no pure form aspect because all manifested form also has some level of consciousness, um, even mineral, you know, and that is all in sonship, right? But at a certain point, the primordial light, as it descends, becomes uh, light as we understand it, recognize it in on physical, on the physical plane. Hope that answers your question. Yes, one further comment or question. Yeah. S-O-N, S-O-N, son, but S-U-N as we see it. Uh, and yes. when we speak of primordial light, primordial, primordial light hmm. are we reflecting the central spiritual sun, centrally? That's where I'd put it, you know, certainly for our, our local, deity that we call SOL, uh, which is the sun, I would say our source of primordial light would be the, um, the central spiritual sun, uh, which is on the third cosmic level. <laughs> That's where I put it. What do you think, Michael, is, would you say? Well, uh, okay. Yeah, you know, when you start using the word like sun, it gets very inclusive. And, and my take on this, he, he gives us something specific in Cosmic Fire, and he says, the causal body of the solar logos is on the first subplane of the cosmic mental plane. But when, when, I've, when I've thought about this, uh, central spiritual sun to me is always meaning the monadic nature. And and therefore, whether you apply it to a to a planetary logos or a solar logos, whatever, 
I'm always going looking for where this monadic nature is placed. It's all relative, you know, these central spiritual sons are relative. So there's a huge light, as you say, you know, a sonship, you know, like the God, the sun, the second aspect, shining on the cosmic mental plane. But when we look for something that is like the dark light, then I think we, we're going to have to go to the monadic nature. Just the way for us little beings, Shambhala is a bunch of dark light. We just don't have the equipment to take in the brilliance, the unfettered enlightenment of Shambhala. We just don't have it. But, right. but it's there, and if we had the equipment, it would be blazingly radiant. It's just the darkness is caused by our inability. Now, one can only imagine what kind of perceiver, perceptual apparatus you're going to need uh, to take in the monadic nature of the solar logos, which I call the central spiritual sun. I would for imagine us, you, would, yeah. you would have to be, you know, at cosmic levels of, of consciousness. I don't think any, uh, yeah. even a master of wisdom or any initiate as we know it would have direct perception of, of, of no, the no, monad no. of a solar logos. I mean, no, no, maybe a, 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 maybe a, a a, a high-ranking planetary logos who's an initiate of high degree, maybe something like that. You something know? like that, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's, you know, you can see the metaphor here in, in what I, the, the slide I have up right now, the metaphor of darkness. Now, you know, as, as Michael mentioned, this, is, this darkness is a movable feast. You know, I mean, we have it just in here. Where are we? just in ultraviolet and infrared, you know, from our, just on the visible spectrum, you know, we have this kind of darkness already, you know, and these are not um, elevated uh, from the point of view of consciousness uh, necessarily, um, but are just simply beyond the wavelength, you know, of, of human perception. But uh, this, this, kind of darkness is being described here, which were, which is the primordial light, um, exists on uh, many levels. Uh, and you could say that it's relevant to uh, whoever is concerned based on that which is just beyond their ability to perceive, you know, that it, it sort of defines the stage uh, that they haven't yet reached, and I think that's uh, you know one of the one of the things that's being described here in this real line. You know, um, then let darkness take the place of light, right? Um, which this darkness is its own light. It's you know at some level, um, but for this uh, band of disciples, it is darkness. Right. So, anyway, not a uh, simple um, uh, philosophical point, but uh, I think it's a provocative one. Okay, let's see if I can get us on to the next segment. Oh, all right. So, with that, we're moving into the commentary on Rule 5. Uh, could we get a Unless you have any further comments, uh, uh, could we get a reader for this um, commentary? Uh, baby, can you read that for us? I, I show yourself muted. There you go. Yeah. Uh, darkness is father, mother's light their son didn't we read this oh we did read this you're right i'm sorry a little bit confused oh. because we've been jumping around sorry about that uh let me go forth okay so um yeah i jumped oh i'm going backwards i'm so sorry hang on just a second okay here we go all right so um, I gave this example. Um, before you read, let me uh, 
I'd like to bring up this uh, example. Um, we're told that initiates registers an experience of primordial light through the spiritual eye or Ajna center as absolute light. Certainly visible light has a resonant connection with these higher forms of light. We see it used in artwork um, as a visual metaphor for absolute light, which is the emanating essence of successively more evolved being. So you could say that, uh, you know, the artist here is using in the aureole on the left and then the radiance on the right, that this in a sense is this primordial light, this spiritual or dark light um, that can be seen uh, by um, one who has um, the access through the third eye or um, Ajna center. In a treatise on white magic, um, uh, DK gives us a quote about the third eye. Could we get a, a reader for this? Okay, please go ahead, Bibi. The third eye manifests as a result of the vibratory interaction between the forces of the soul working through the pineal gland and the forces of the personality working through the pituitary body. These negative and positive forces interact and when potent enough produce the light in the head. Just as the physical eye came into being in response to the light of the sun, so the spiritual eye equally comes into being in response to the light of the spiritual sun. As the aspirant develops, he becomes aware of the light. I refer to the light in all forms, veiled by all the sheets and expressions of the divine life, and not just to the light within the aspirant himself. As his awareness of the light increases, so does the apparatus of vision develop, and the mechanism whereby he can see things in the spiritual light comes into being in the etheric body. This is the eye of Shiva, for it is only fully utilized in the magical work when the monadic aspect, the will aspect, is controlling. Thank you, B. So any thoughts and questions about this? Um... Uh, illuminating a passage from a Treatise on White Magic. Anyone? Okay, let's get back to the Secret Doctrine and uh, uh, if we could get a, a reader for HPB's next statement here. James, can you read that for us, please? I don't hear him. I just hear interference. Okay. Um, Elena, can you read that for us, please? Uh, nope. David, can you read that for us, please? I'm not getting anybody. Uh, let me just read it. <laughs> there you go. I can read. I can read. Okay, thank you. Okay. To you. To you. <laughs> this is Yama, actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How far we discern the light that shines in the darkness depends upon our power of vision. What is light to us is darkness to certain insects. And the eye of the clairvoyant sees illumination where the normal eye perceives only blackness. When the whole universe was plunged in sleep, had returned to its one primordial element, there was neither center of luminosity nor eye to perceive light, and darkness necessarily filled the 
boundless all. Wow. Yes. Thank you, Tuya. So the quality of our consciousness can be measured in terms of the degree of our ability to perceive light. Uh, we you know, kind of determined this as we've been going along here. So any thoughts or questions about this beautifully um, written passage? Also, HPP suggests that during periods of pralaya, light ceases to exist because it is an effect. It belongs to the sonship. It's an emanation, and emanations only occur naturally during periods of manifestation. Even, you know, the the highest levels of of darkness, which are light, such as what Michael was discussing, you know, at at cosmic monadic levels, are uh, cease to exist uh, at times of pralaya, at least at times of Maha Pralaya, you know, where all is drawn back into um, the absolute. Uh, so, any any thoughts? Yes, Scott. I have a thought, Francis. Just, yes, oh, go sorry, ahead. sorry, Scott. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is that me? Yeah. Go ahead, Scott. Just, just a couple side points here. Um, one, Francis, if you would sometimes move your cursor out of the way, it's in the text, makes it hard to read. Also, um, you skipped two sentences above this that seemed really important, and I don't know if you intended to or are bouncing around, you missed it. One that starts with the sentence says, darkness then. Did you intend to leave that out? No, I never intend to leave anything out. Okay. Let me see. Okay, let me, let me pull back and see if we can pick it up. Yeah. There it is. Darkness then. Okay, we got ahead of ourselves. Um, I hit a wrong button on this, and it, and it sent me back about 15 slides. Sorry about that. And then I got uh, confused as to where we are. So um, let's uh, drop back and punch. Since you're on point, uh, can you hold that thought, Michael? Um, and when we, when yeah, we yes, get back. Okay. Of course. Uh, and then uh, we'll we'll go ahead and read this. Uh, Scott, since you're on point, would you just go ahead and read it? Darkness then, and thanks for catching that. Yeah. Darkness then is the eternal matrix in which the sources of light appear and disappear. Nothing is added to darkness to make of it light, or to light to make it darkness on this our plane. They're interchangeable. And scientifically, light is but a mode of darkness, and vice versa. Yet both are phenomena of the same noumenon, which is absolute darkness to the scientific mind, but a gray twilight to the perception of the average mystic. Though to that of the spiritual eye of the initiate, it is absolute light. There we are. That's where that. Thanks so much, Scott. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, just like in real life, you get me back on track once in a while. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, we, we have a few concepts to navigate through here. First of all, darkness then is the eternal matrix in which the sources of light appear and disappear. So darkness is the eternal matrix, which is the absolute, uh, is also the source of primordial light which substands, or is the source of the Mayavic light, the conditions, all Manvantaras. Next, as we all know, and then we'll just breeze through this, um, scientifically light and darkness are determined by their wavelengths. All non-visible light, such as ultraviolet and infrared, are experienced as darkness. This darkness, however, is as much a phenomenon of primordial light as visible light is, which is perhaps why HPV says that light and darkness are interchangeable. Um, I I'm suspect that there's more to this interchangeability. Um, any thoughts or questions about this idea? And then finally, we're told that the initiate registers an experience of primordial light through the spiritual eye or Ajna Center 
as absolute light, certainly visible light, as its resonant connections. And we, we explore this idea. Okay. All right. That catches us up. Um, so back to the SD. And we just read this. And now if you've held on to your comment, Michael, you can. Well, there is one way of looking at light, which um, uh, is uh, Kabbalistic. And I think is somewhat embraced by the modern scientists that light is equivalent to matter. Mm -hmm. In other words, that the whole universe can be resolved as light and is a precipitation of light. Now, whether that light is visible to our particular uh, apparatus, that's a whole nother story, you know. But always there would be a visibility given a sufficient apparatus. I also have the, I'm just sort of wondering where HPB is centering herself. You know, now DK gives us so many uh, cosmic and implied super cosmic planes that at the level that HPB is pitching this, I wonder if we can talk about absolute light. I wonder if we can talk about anything absolute that is not Venus itself, the utter homogeneity yeah. and not give it, you know, the various names that we use yeah. down here, you know. So I, you know, I, I have a little bit of difference in scale when I think mm -hmm. about how HPB is uh, uh, presenting this and the implications of what the Tibetan is presenting. But for me, the whole idea that in the Kabbalah, there is this um, ein, ein sof, yeah. which is absoluteness, and then there is the that which came forth, which is the fundamental light material out of all, out of which all things are made, whether perceivable or not perceivable. Mm -hmm. See, so yes. we, we just got to get our, we just got to get our system clear yeah, uh, yeah, and in a D, uh, HPB presents one system. It's a little difficult to orient ourselves on the various planes with with her because she didn't pay so much attention to that. Uh, when DK comes in, he he's paid a lot more attention to that, yeah. and it'd be nice to be able to reconcile uh, those two systems. Yeah, it would be. You know, it's so much easier, I'm sure to read this material having read DK, because we bring a certain understanding to this that just wasn't available at the time in 1888 when this was published, you know. And I agree with you. I think she tends to jump scale and perspective a lot from um, cosmic, logoic, uh, causal levels, you know, down to uh, our own personal levels, you know, and then back again. Uh, and it's it's easy to lose a sense of the just where you know these concepts are being applied. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if we go to the stanza itself, that that um, uh, that quality is 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 more unified. That I think we're talking purely on cosmic levels if we look just at these uh, verses of the stanzas. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, do you, uh, Tia? I can't talk right now. Tuya, please go ahead. She has a question. Yama. <laughs> Yama. It's so much yeah, easier Yama. to say. It is so much easier to say. <laughs> I'm gonna have a one. Right. Uh, if, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I Maya, think. Maya, please help me <laughs> because it just came to me, and I um. I don't know is this giving any insight or does it even relevant here, but it just came to me when we, this first sentence, how far we discern the light that shines in darkness depends upon our power of vision. So DK gives us two groups where he mentions light, vibration, light, sound color 
and then he has sound light color. Uh, and if we think about these two places where he mentions light, I think we could put light related to astral plane and light related to the monadic plane. And when we think um, the astral plane, which is uh, um, ruled or governed by the group of devas who are Agnesurians. And Agnesurians are those which are related to the vision building. Mm. So, so that was giving me the, some kind of, this kind of practical connection to this, um, that this, uh, the light which shines in the darkness, like uh, the light on the monadic plane, depends upon our powers of vision of that light on the mm. astral plane. Uh -huh. yeah. So just this kind of thought, I not have been thinking about that uh, in relationship, of course, but um, is there anything, Michael, you could add to that or does this make maybe, any sense? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, uh, Maya is too full of Maya to say anything intelligent, so... Uh, <laughs> well, I think we can say that there is a light at every plane. You know, we've all heard of... of right. You know, Mayavik, Maya is, in, is, you know, if you look at the concept of illusion, glamour, and Maya, Maya is, is specific to physical planes, so Mayavik light or secondary light, mm -hmm. I think really just is... is um, you know, relates to the physical plane. However, you know, from a cosmic perspective, you've got the entire cosmic physical plane that mm. is, is certainly also myavic in terms of the light that shines there. Sure. But from yeah. our perspective, every plane has its light. You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the whole quality of the soul is light. So the higher mental is a place of light, which is, you know, that specific light. And it, I'm sure that every plane that this quality that is that we call light uh, has its own uh, has its own quality. Sure. Yeah. Light has its own quality on every plane. I would say. Sure. You know what, folks? We're way over time, and <laughs> I hate to have stop right here, but we are now over two hours and I, I've uh, I've uh, sworn to keep us under that time limit so um, as fascinating as this discussion is I think we're gonna have to pull the plug right here and we'll pick up um, with this light on the next webinar which will be on the third Sunday of November I'm not sure what that date is the 18th can you hear me? We, we're yes, losing you. you. Are you? Okay, now you're back. You were gone oh. there for a minute. But yeah, no, the 18th right. of November is the next one. Terrific. Okay, so uh, until then, everyone, thank you all so much for attending. Sorry for confusing the images there uh, at the end. But we're now back on track, and we'll pick up where we left off. Until then... Thanks again for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Good night, everyone. Good morning. Good, night. Good whatever. <laughs> <laughs>